able to okay, run it my in a public setting. So because of that, we are running it in the FMA discussion group tonight, uh, which enables a public setting so everybody can watch. So hopefully mm -hmm. that doesn't cause anybody any inconvenience. Uh, apologies, but we want just to make sure that it was accessible to everybody as opposed to a private setting on my wall where maybe there would be folks <clears throat> who could not watch it. Before we go any further, I get into introductions and uh, tonight's agenda questions. Um, Guru Mambaki is going to say a prayer for all of us. Okay, let's begin. Heavenly Father, we come to you this hour asking for your blessing and help as we are gathered together. You know clearly what separates us all in the FMA industry. Envy, greed, jealousy, ego, the quest to be famous. Many practitioners now are free to disrespect the elders because it's their shortcut to get, to get attention. We pray for guidance in the matters at hand and ask that you would clearly show us how to conduct this program with a spirit of joy and enthusiasm. Give us the desire to find ways to excel in our work. This we ask through the mighty name of your, of your son, Christ. Amen. 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 <clears throat> All right. So I'm just giving a message. Somebody just asked if it was running on my wall. So I'm just sending them a quick message to let them know it's in the group. Um, and let me just see how that's working out. And then I'm gonna get going with the uh, introductions of everybody. So those who just jumped in <clears throat> are watching, again, normally speaking, may I run this on my wall, but because of uh, the settings was not enabling us to run it public, um, we are running it in the FMA group, which is enable us to run public. So if that inconvenience anybody, I apologize. Like usual, this will be recorded, put on YouTube and all that. So will be definitely accessible for those who maybe were not able to see it live. Again, if any inconveniences, I apologize for that. And we're gonna jump into it. Uh, before I get into the introductions, I just wanna, I wanna thank you uh, all four for uh, doing this. Um, this is, exciting and getting four guests and all that and I you know and you guys have done a lot of legwork and homework and I you know, I appreciate all your efforts and that so all right here goes with here we go with the introduction of the guest our first guest he is a professor an anthropologist of the University of the Philippines a writer author and historian and the Filipino <laughs> martial arts instructor Please welcome mm. Professor Felipe Jocano. Hi guys. Hello everyone. Hello morning, everyone. Good morning, morning, bro. Morning, everyone. Second. Morning from the Rainy Philippines. <laughs> Second, he was the marketing and development manager of Nestle Philippines, a writer historian, one of the authors of the best-selling book, Sabano Escrima, a Largo Mana Escrima instructor, the, aka the Renaissance Man, Celestino Macatur. Renaissance man. Good morning, Mano. Good morning, guys. Good morning. Good morning. Merry Christmas, everyone. Merry Christmas, Mano. Hope you enjoy this show. <laughs> Number three, he is a researcher, a writer, historian, an expert on permaculture, and an FMA instructor. Please welcome Guru Elric Jundis, who is Luck, uh, we're so lucky that he is actually hosting this on his Zoom account. Thank you. Hi, Thank you very much, Elric. Welcome, everybody. Elric. Yeah, thank you. Last, Thanks for doing this. Not least, he is a writer, a fight analyst. I didn't know that. <laughs> and a oh, yeah? former <laughs> columnist in the sports section of the Middle of the Times newspaper, one of the tactical and trainers in the special military groups in Russia, the chapter president of the patriotic Russian Night Wolves Motorcycle Club. Please welcome Guru Mobaki, Daniel Fernando. Hey, welcome it's all. Foronda. It's Foronda. You mentioned my surname Foronda. wrong. 
that's a uh, porn star in the Philippines, you know. <laughs> okay. Let's, uh, Never heard we of the guy. Uh, we, we, okay. we, won't, we won't tackle that. But anyhow, before we get into the main discuss, um, topics and the questions, uh, Guru Mambaki wanted to give us a quick recap for the audience on the uh, prior discussions that we had in the past. Okay, I'll make it quick. I'll make it very, very quick. I guess by now everybody agrees that the word Kali does not exist in the Filipino vocabulary. All right, we have that cleared. Uh, so guys who are still pushing the issue about the history of Kali, please stop it. All right, it did not come from the Philippines. We don't have this word. Uh, never, it has been uh, a part of, of a culture in Philippines. And so uh, I think most of you guys who are here will agree on that. Uh, just stop the history. Um, Manong Tini, Celestino Makachor, and I were discussing that for us, it's okay to be used as a, a, an alternative name for Filipino martial arts. But to, to put more uh, on, the, on this word, Kali, like the false history, well, we do not agree on that, okay? Uh, in the first place, we owe the word Kali because uh, it has made the Filipino martial arts famous. But this word came from the U.S. It wasn't in our vocabulary. What do you think, Manong Kini? Never. <laughs> Because uh, yeah. <laughs> as, uh, one of the earliest earliest known term for that describes uh, the fighting arts came from William Henry Scott in his book, uh, 16th Century Filipino Martial Arts and Culture. The word was Barangay. Aspang. Yeah, Barangay. Yeah. Yeah. 16th, uh, 16th Century Filipino Martial Arts and Culture. So the only word that came out from William Henry Scott is Asdang. It's still widely used in Cebu in the Visayan region of the day to mean to attack, to raid, or to assault. Kali, mm -hmm. never mentioned by Scott. Mm -hmm. I think that's all. Actually, if I may add something, Daniel? Yeah. Of um, the word Kali is actually obsolete. No? The Kali, our generation never grew up knowing the word Kali as the term for our martial arts. So it's just a bit puzzling when you find on the net people say, you don't know the history of your own art. You don't know the word Kali. But it's simple. It's obsolete. It's already no longer used. In fact, the, er the other early reference to Kali comes from, uh, there, there are two that I know of. One is from Buenaventura Miracuente's book, his chapter on history of the Filipino martial arts, which was included in Placido Yambao's manual of the arts. All right. Now, uh, a lot of people make a big deal out of that because, hey, it's an old source. The problem is, uh, Yam Miracuente never gave an idea where he got the sources from on the word. What we do know is the actual term for swordsmanship, weaponry, fighting, is kalis, which is also a derivative or analog for the, or similar to the term for kris, or kalis, which is basically sword. Uh, I, the, the biggest problem is not so much in the term kalis, which is the sword, but rather the history of kali as the mother martial art or whatever it is that has been often uh, talked about in and repeated in so many sources on the internet. We don't have any documentary evidence that any art, such art called Kali ever took place. There are different terms for skills in swords. Yeah, you're, you're good in Kalis. In fact, even in the, the other source for Kalis is from, an, I think this is the San Buenaventura Dictionary, which can be found online in Dictionary of Tagalog and Spanish. Okay, Tagalog Espanol Dictionario. Dictionario uh, de la lengua Tagala y Espanol. And if I'm not mistaken, Kalis is mentioned in the context of a sword. In more recent sources, like this one in the Dictionary of Father James English, 1987, the Tagalog English Dictionary, uh, Kalis is just simply mentioned as a sword. The other term for Kalis is the Spanish for the word calix, which is the part of the flower. Okay, which is also look like a very flattened and wide sword. 
uh, the distinction I think we need to make is the Kalis as the tool, the weapon, the art, the, the tool or Huh. Oh, Do we lose him? Uh, Looks like he lost Professor Bob. Well, well uh, hopefully they'll jump back on, but I'll, I'll, I'll continue. Okay. Uh, just from a U.S. context, uh, yeah, first, the oldest thing that we can find, saying Kali, like you said, the 1950s book uh, by Yambao and Mirafuente. Uh, and then the next would be in 1980, Dan Santos Filipino Martial Arts. In terms of the first group publicly using the term, it's the Villa Bray Largusa system. And one thing to, to put is like martial arts don't happen, public martial arts don't happen in a vacuum. Um, you had the, the eras of karate in the United States, the judo, and then the 70s was kung fu. Um, and then, you know, got taekwondo getting popular. FMA really started to get big in the 80s after Dan Inosanto's book. And you got to realize that they were promoting FMA in the United States after the civil rights era. So people were going deep into their roots. They're trying to get outside of the colonial perspective. So I get the Phil Am perspective, since I'm, I am a Phil Am, of wanting to get something that was before the Spanish. But the history is, doesn't fit. And as I spent, you know, early 90s talking to the generations before me. There we are. No one was doing using the term Kali. And actually, a lot of the old men took extreme offense to it. In Stockton, no one knew it. And then no one used the term there, even though we hear about now certain people are attributed to using the term Kali. It didn't exist. And Montini had done that same research. I mean, we didn't originally, we thought there was going to be Kali. We looked for it. Montini's traveled, you know, throughout the Visayas and Mindanao looking for it. Okay. Oh, yeah. Sakana and I have talked to different uh, Salat yeah. partners for myself, Maginda now, but mostly from the uh, Sulu Archipelago, Basilan and uh, Holo. No yeah. one there uses that term. <laughs> no one, no one. And they actually don't, they don't like being told, you don't know your history. It's like, what are you talking about? We've been studying this stuff all our lives. Because some people are serious about the history. And, yeah. you know, it's offensive. It is. Okay. Through Sorry, guys. Lucky, um, internet you know, for a while. Okay. Uh, you know, welcome no back, bro. Just, Thanks. That happens, just jump back on like you did. Perfect. Guru Maki, did you have anything else that you wanted to cover from the previous episodes? Um, well, I guess all, only that word has been popping out every time i have my own theories but don't take me seriously because i'm gonna make fun of it <laughs> so probably uh, <laughs> no 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 <laughs> it's, it's not it's not good it's not good it's uh... <laughs> okay <laughs> okay maybe manutini you have you have something to say before we move on like what Eric said, uh, I spent 23 years in Mindanao during my employment with Nestle, and I used to believe in that story. Because the, my co author, Dr. Ned Nipangi, he visited me in the Zambis in 2001, and I was wearing a Kali t shirt, something like that, <laughs> and printed. So I'm a big fan of Dan Santo. No, no, I have nothing personal against him. I'm a big fan of Dan Santo and Bruce Lee. I also have the book, The Filipino Martial Arts. Mm -hmm. then, Same here. Can you check out? Because uh, in that book, he says, uh, he said that Kali is from the South. So I took the challenge of Dr. Ned and I went around, I went as far as Dominga, well, Muslim dominated areas because it's simple common sense. Uh, if you want to find a real martial arts, uh, what they say is a moral art, you could find it in the black missing centers in Mindanao. So I went to to Dominga because they make uh, fine quality blades there. I found nothing. I went as far as Margusa Tubig with my self threat. Then when I arrived in Margusa Tubig, one of the one of our Nestle dealers warned me. That he said, "You know, say so you're the first Nestle supervisor who visited this area. I think you should go back right away." Why? You know, the store right over there, right in front of us, we just got kidnapped last week. Oh shit! So nothing. There's nothing there. Uh, 
the, the our Moro brothers, uh, the Maranao, just oh, never heard of it. Maybe you can buy my my mat, my banig, but never heard of that. So that's it. <laughs> okay, so we all agree on that. Yeah, yeah. I just I'm gonna name a little name. Well, I'm not gonna name names, but I've spoken to the former governor of, and I can't remember the province, but he's beginning now. He's he's a Datu. And, you know, his, you know, his son is the uh, current senator, like never heard of it. Uh, Professor O'Connor, I studied from uh, Guru uh, Yashir Tananjalan. Yes. Uh, Yakan. And, yeah. you know, I remember one time sitting at the Philippine Sports Complex in Manila with him mm -hmm. and several other national coaches. Uh, the other ones were Al Tal Sug. And it's like, no, there is no Kali known by the Tao Sug, known by the Yakan. These yeah. are, and then some of these guys are former MNLF, guys with bullet holes who fought yep. and then <laughs> national athletes. So we're not talking about just anybody. We're talking to like, these are some of the top line, top of the line for uh, public coaches, you know, and some of them have passed on, but the research we've done is, you know, Montini, 23 years. <laughs> 23 years. <laughs> Never existed. Yeah. Uh, you know, the, the, the most research person for the book that we did, it's been a good friend of mine. He's Pute also. Uh, in fact, he's related to uh, the stored bearer of the Sultan of Zulu, uh, Muhammad Sattu Kali. Uh, was repeated to have taught uh, Tatang Lustrisimo, some silat well, it was, uh, I think it was uh, Sali Nagarahen's great great grand uncle. So I talked with Sali for less of time um, and told me, no, this is non-existent. So I asked him, how about what the silat uh, influences in Filipino martial arts? Uh, no, uh, because uh, Sali Nagarahen told me that the ordinary Moro warrior it's never available to them, the silat and the kuntao arts. It's only learned by the nobility and the, the moral land. So that's it. Uh, what could be more reliable than coming from the founder of the Filipino Moral Ar Fighting Arts Association? That's all, <laughs> finally. Guru um, Mbaki, uh, uh, yeah. should we, um... Just to get first time to get all questions. Want to go to question? I'm going to start the questions. Okay. Okay. Yes. So first question um, we have blade movements to empty hands. Mm -hmm. Professor Jocano, what could you share with us on that? Okay. Uh, there's been a great deal of attempts to make blade movement into empty hand movement. Uh, that the, the usual story that you see on FMA sites is, well, blade and stick is translatable to empty hand. The stick is an extension of the hand. The blade is an extension of the hand. When you remove the stick or the sword or the knife, then you have the empty hand. Um, it's not as easy as that. Some might be translatable, but there are many more that are not you really have to learn something totally different if you want to go into fist fighting. You really have to learn something different. It's an example. If I make, uh, it, if it doesn't upset too many people in the audience. All right, this is a short blade. Right, this is a crowded house, so we have a short blade. <laughs> okay. Look at this. This is number one. Okay, everybody knows. I know, well, not everybody knows. You know, there are some people who are different angling on this. All right. Uh, brother, brothers in the West, you call this the forehand, backhand. Okay, there we go. So, here we go. Blade turning in my hand. <laughs> okay, so here, here. Oh, Elwood's got a nice and longer one. <laughs> okay, now you have this. You have this. How in the world is this going to translate into this? This or this? Maybe. But in what context? Is this what you use by throwing a this fight? No. No, why? In, when you're fighting empty hand, you go straight to your uh, standard weapon, a punch, a slap, maybe an open hand palm strike. Can you use this? Maybe can you generate the same power? Yeah, you could. But is it advisable? Not always. Because it's not as easy as most people think. 
uh, training in empty hand arts requires equal dedication and time as training in the weapon arts. Correct. If you have an integrated art, like Silat, for example, or Kuntao, or some FMA systems include a fair amount of grappling and boxing into their systems, then how much time are you spending with your empty hand compared to the focus, which is the weapon? You have to have a focus somewhere. Right? So it's not that easily easily translated. Here's another one, and we're just talking about biomechanics. This is a popular movie. Ocho, number eight. Okay. So I'm sitting down and this is horrible movement. All right. How does this translate into empty hand? Here? Here? What sense does this movement have? What what kind of uh, mechanically, what is this supposed to do? But this one is easy enough to translate. You, know, you have an uppercut. But what is this supposed to do? This is, is a this supported by a body? Yeah. Right. But you know, this is a lot. You bait him into getting on, but so you could do something. Sorry, <laughs> I know. <laughs> but, but you know, somewhere out there, someone is thinking about that. <laughs> you know what? It, it, Mechanically, I'm not, I'm not even mechanically. It doesn't make sense either. I mean, I'm not much of a. I'm not even in the sports sciences, okay. But we don't know how to make sense of this. Not unless you only take half of the movement. But what is the sense in doing a blade movement and then use only half of it for the fist? No, you have to do something else. Now, it's better to say there are analogies between the two. Analogies between the two. I, I, I know people that will insist, for example, that when you cut like this, you're also punching. Um, yeah, that's true also. It's possible. Okay? You punch. So you have a punching cut. And I learned how to do that with one of the styles I studied, the Thales Illy system. And it functioned very well. Now, I said this analogies. Why? Because when Mangtoni brought out the pads, he taught me to, he made me change my chambering a bit and was able to teach me how to do some punching. And I just regret I wasn't able to go deeper and further into that with him. Right? But that's another story. But to make it appear that there is this, this is a favorite movement. Here. This one. This one. This one. Okay, so the Spada Ibaga. Again, um, the problem is, if you use it with the wrong timing, this will be open here. Right. So there are, it's not as simple as saying that the movement will exactly translate into this. No, empty hand fighting requires a different set of strategies compared to blade or stick fighting. It requires a different set of thinking. And you have to harmonize the mindset between the two. You have to, you have to make them blend together. Uh, I think people got influenced by the fact that the some of the foreign arts, like um, the Japanese Aikido, for instance, are really translatable from the sword direct to the graphic. Why? This movement here is also the same as what you need with the, the same energy you need to feed off into the Aiki techniques. And a lot of it is sword taking. A lot of it is backup that is techniques for sword taking. What about us? Uh, FMA evolved in a different direction compared to the indigenous arts. In the Silat and Kuntao from the South, for example, the relationship between the blade and the empty hand is much closer. But in FMA, we diverge a great deal. Why? Perhaps because of many of the influences that have crept into the arts, which is inevitable because, you know, you're part of a global system, you're part of a global economy. Okay? So, uh, to sum it up then, this is a translating blade to empty hand, translating stick work to empty hand. It's not that easy. You have to train something different. Even if you use the same movement, you have to train differently. There's a different sense of power generation from one to the other. Okay? That's one. There's a mindset that you can develop using both so you can transition from one to the other. Again, that's possible. You can adapt techniques of empty hand arts into your FMA style, and it's been done. In the style I came from, the styles I came from, that there was plenty of those. And you know, they they could be made to work because it was just a matter of your training time. 
But you really want it to work? You really want to translate it? Okay, fine. How much time are you going to devote to it? If your training time for average session is two hours, how much of that is empty hand work? Unless you do a separate session on empty hands, in which case, you know, your art is going to look different. All right? So again, like I said, it's not that easy. Some people have done it, and you know, some people have, some arts have a closer relationship between the two, but mainly of the FMA in general, you need some tweaking in order to make the relationship between the two much closer. Again, like I said, there's parallelisms between the two. It's easy enough to see. But to translate one into the other requires a lot of work and requires a tweaking of your curriculum and requires that it's not as easy as to do so. Right, no, thank you. Thank you. Question number two. Scarf as a weapon versus empty hand. So I guess we'll give first crack to Guru Mabaki and then others can chime in if they so wish to. So Guru Mabaki, scarf as a weapon versus empty hands. Okay, uh, I will be quick with uh, my answer on that. Uh, I will always go for the adage, it's better to have something or anything than have nothing at all when situations uh, arise, okay? So if, know. let's say, my, my attacker, can you hear me, guys? Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, okay. Uh, Just stab okay. me with the toothbrush. Guru, uh, Guru, okay. Elric, uh, Guru Elric was being funny. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so let's say my, my attacker has a weapon, a uh, club, probably, uh, just any weapon. And I have a scarf with me, and that's the only thing I have to defend myself. I'll make use, I'll make use of it definitely, but only at a limited uh, movement to defend myself. Because honestly, uh, I'll tell you this: if my attacker does not have any weapon at all, and I have a scarf, I'll just wrap wrap my scarf around my fist, and then I'll use it. I, I'll use my fist to box with him. That's the easiest way. Now, uh, I've done Silat, I've done Kuntao, and I really admire the Indonesian art of using the scarf. <clears throat> but the demonstrations are different. It's very different to real fight. Okay, Some of it, maybe, maybe some of it can work. Maybe. All right. But you have to remember your attacker or uh, your opponent they keep on moving. You cannot just simply catch them. You cannot simply catch, catch an attacking, you know, attacking fist with these. If that's a boxer, you'll be dead. You know, you could not even sometimes duck or block a boxer's punch. Or what more catch it and wrap it with, with a scarf. I'm not yeah, saying, I'm not saying, yeah, I'm not saying that it, May not, uh, I'm not saying it doesn't work. It, it may work in certain situations, maybe. And of course, it can be used for choking. It depends also on the skill of that person attacking you. If that person is well-trained and you are using a scarf, well, you, you better think twice. But for me, I'll just wrap my, my fist with a scarf and just use my hands for punching. That, that's the easiest way. Okay, I, I respect the Indonesian art. Indonesian art, okay, because it's not, uh, the scarf is not Filipino. The scarf techniques, it's it's not from the Philippines. Um, no, most yeah. of that, I mean, probably to me it comes down to yeah. who, um, anybody else that would like Can to I? take a crack at that? Can I? Yes, sure. 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 Um, look, among other things, uh, again, sometimes the problem with the way these things are presented online, they're presented as absolutes. So you, you have some questions to ask further. One, uh, what is the real purpose of a scarf anyway? Okay, to wrap around your neck? Was it a mark of identity or what? It's a long cloth, okay? A towel, yeah. It's also to wrap around the chest, yeah? But... Um, was it really a weapon? Um, yes and no, because it's a backup. Look, what happened 
um, Mumbaki just said it perfectly. What happened if you got caught and that was all that you had? Then you use what you got. So you learn how to use it. All right. But um, how much training time do you put in to make it work? That's another consideration. Especially since, as Mumbaki mentioned, uh, the Indonesian version of these arts, there are, in fact, silat systems that specialize in scarf work. And they don't even call it, use it the scarf, but it's the sarong. sarong. Which brings us to the next consideration. You have a scarf, but you have a sarong or the malong. And one of the things to consider is how strong is the material? How thick is it? Is it thick enough to withstand the strain of... Uh, wrapping around somebody. I mean, if you have a towel, Mumbaki brought out the towel. That's pretty thick. It could make the towel work, I guess, right? But the scarf material that we normally associate, the decorative scarf that we wear around the neck, how strong is that? How thick is that? Can it withstand the strain of the fighting? And if you have a malong, yan, Elric has a beautiful one there. There, see? See how he wears it? Mm. There you go. Oh, yeah. uh, you really want to risk something that beautiful in fighting? Uh, I don't think I would. Yeah. Right? Cultural I want to context, use it for what it is. Cultural context matters. In some yes. areas, this is everyday wear. So yeah. you, have it, you would use it. Because now you have yeah. something to protect yourself because you're wearing it anyway. But right. why would Mumbaki or I in Manila ever use this? So. Right. <laughs> yeah. There's that. And that's the, one of the most important questions to consider. I mean, you know, you grow up using it or not? Do you really know how to use it that way? Was it part of your normal way? Yeah. So true. Uh, whatever. See? And that's another major consideration too. And that's why, well, some techniques are probably analogous to use of flexible ones, but ah, that's a different one. But you know what? These things are emergency backup things. They're not the primary weapons. They're just there because they happen to be there when you needed when you needed to be there. That's why Eric's right. This is the cultural context. People know how to use it because they grew up every day using it. I go out that wearing that in Mani here in Manila, and I get gonna get looked at funny. <laughs> I mean, and I have worn it in Manila, and I do get looked at yeah. funny. <laughs> See, you speak. I speak from theory. You speak from experience. There you go. <laughs> Even better. Yeah. Yeah. All right. All right. Uh, question three, and this is for Mong Plastino. Stick training is actually from the art of sword fighting. Mm, no. <laughs> <laughs> those are That's two here. different uh, those are two different animals but I would assume that uh, later on as uh, uh, out of convenience uh, from the way we fought uh, with swords back in the old days uh, there were some uh, some um, Filipino natives who were trained by the Spanish priest in Grima I uh, I would assume it's Gima Komun. Then due to the, for safety reasons, uh, it evolved into sticks. But later on, it became more stick focused than blade oriented. So that's how, it, um, uh, that's how it evolved. So now we have two different, um, two different uh, disciplines altogether because uh, First of all, the center of gravity balance is different. Check second uh, balance is center of gravity. You use a difficult force. A different uh, balance uh, and the center of gravity using the blades. So uh, for those who claim that uh, stick is transferable to blade, um, these are two different disciplines. I always uh, suggest that they study the illustrative system. So far, just the only authentic FMA that really, you know, is into the science of, of the blade fight. Other than that, um, the others are the just pure uh, stick arts. And, and I see a lot of them do Carenza, the Redondo movement, the Abanico. That's <laughs> silly, you know. You don't do Abanico, you don't do Abanico, the blade, right? <laughs> 
<laughs> I think that's all I can. I can yeah, you do that to the blade, you ruin your now, risk. Now look, Guru is now demonstrating. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. Okay. Incorrect. <laughs> Correct. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Good night. Uh, uh, may I? I yeah. would like to sure. so it's like we kind of touched on, you know, weapon to empty hand. Martin is talking about stick the blade. Yesterday I was uh, like, you know, I'm a practitioner too. I spar with folks and I was watching uh, a video by uh, Lonely Dog, uh, one of the best known Dog Brother martial arts instructors. And it was really nice to hear. It was a workout video about, you know, what call the caveman, San Miguel Angle One. And it was nice to hear him say it's like, his methodology for developing is specific to the stick. And at one point in time, it was important to say like there's a universal universality of movement, you know, and that it helped people see things. But there's so many FMA traditional systems, I say traditional stuff that's been here in the Philippines for at least 50 years, where they have different ways of hitting with the stick that allows them to generate power that works better for the stick. Those who really know the blade, Though it's like how I might cut, like right now there's some videos going around of people just like tossing up a piece of paper and cutting it literally twice. How you do that is not how you do something in a stick fight and make someone be afraid of you. But if I can do that with a blade, darn tootin' you're gonna be scared of that blade. But also I've done things like cutting through ham hocks. <laughs> One cut through the actual bone hanging from a string. That's a different skill set. So they, you know, if you're really using it, you have to know the tool. How I would use yeah. this 25 yeah. inch blade is different than how I'd use like a 30 inch European saber or how I'd use, you know, a barong or how I'd use a talibong. They each have different nuances. And you only get that by putting the time in. You know, people give lip, lip service to things that, unless you test it, it's like kind of nonsense. Mm -hmm. May I also add something? Here Please do. All right, here we go. Several years I've been uh, practicing with the stick. Now you said the stick translates to the blade. Mm, not that easy. See this? Here, look. Here is a habit that most people unconsciously do because of the stick. Yeah. yeah. See? The, the blade turns in your hand because you've been doing the stick for so long. If you have to change your grip, this is one that I was that is a favored one here, so that the edge is going forward all the time. But look at the camera. See? The stick still speaks strongly through the blade. Why? It, I'm supposed to show you only my edge, what's happening. You can see the flat of my blade. And that is why it is not as easy to translate the stick to the blade. You have to train, as Elric said, you have to train a very specific skill set. Otherwise, yes. what works for one is going to speak to the other and it's not necessarily for the good. I mean, look at this. Huh? You have a diagonal uh, strike, you have a diagonal cut, you have a diagonal cut, and this is pretty much fairly universal. But the way you do it, you see, it's turning in the hand. The stick is still speaking to me. So I have to train extra hard on the blade in order to let the blade speak through me. And I'm being frank about this because uh, there are many ways in which this shows up. One is why cutting objects. Can you cut cleanly through it? There you go. If you can cut cleanly, then your blade is properly aligned. But each time it bounces off, then you know that your blade is not aligned. So how much time do you spend training that? I mean, you have this a specialized blade is a specialized set of knowledge. This is specialized skill skill set. Stick is a specialized skill set. Movements can be same, but not the same. If you like to put it, the abanico is one of those. Okay, I mean you can do that. But is it a cutting abanico or like the flatting this one? This one is this. All due respect to everybody, this is the stick at work. Here and here. That's your blade at work. It's a simple enough movement. But where are you bringing your weapon? That's why 
it's not that easily translatable. Uh, to do, to make anything workable out of it, be willing to empty your cup, start from zero, start all over again. Blade is blade, stick is stick. Movements are movements. There. Just keep that, those three distinctions in mind. And it, it you know, it'll be easy to get the, if you, if you want to have a union of all of this knowledge internalized, it will be easier for you. Yeah. Yeah. I have a question yeah. for you guys. Um, I just find this really interesting. Anybody getting answered? Do you, I always felt, and again, from my personal journey, and I'm not, I'm just speaking for myself, that I really found it um, and appreciated when the modules per se, if I have a better script, descriptive word, were separated. In other words, stick, curriculum here, yeah. sword, curriculum here. Yeah. Do you think that's beneficial for what, you, Professor Jukana, for what you just articulated for the student? They should, in fact, be definitely separated. Yes. Yes. Look, here's one thing. Here's a third dimension to consider. Well, of course, one, uh, movement-wise, right? If you want to start with the stick, make them excel in the stick. And they want to get to start with the, when they get to working with the blade, Get them to start all over again, be beginners with the blade. Uh, how much time do you have to train and how much time do you want to put in the training anyway? That should be the main question at work here. You want skill. There's another one that we haven't uh, touched yet, but I think we should because it's not, this is the elephant in the room uh, so far as many FMAs are concerned. Uh, very few people talk about the legal aspects of the weapons you're training. I'm training to cut you with this. So I carry this all the time with you. And then one day I lose my, I lose it, I get mad, and I kill somebody with it. And that, that's a different set of consequences altogether. Yeah, you got your skill, all right, but what did you do with it? Well, that's with the stick. The same thing applies to the stick. I mean, you have to be careful also. But you see, between the two, the stick is legal to carry. Right here, at least in this country, because of the what has helped us greatly is the fact that the uh, sticks, the what we use for our FMA for our NIS, are also viewed as tools for sports and physical education. Right, so um, no nobody takes a second look at you and you carry. I, I was carrying once a short uh, stick. Okay, it was a carved uh, flat edged stick. And then a uh, policeman saw me carrying it, was asking in Tagalog, anong laman yan? And he said, what's inside that? Wala lang ho, kahoy, stick. Pwede yung matignan? Sure. Cooperate naman. Opened it. Ah, kala ko ho kasi bakal eh. Sabi niya, you know, in English, he said, I thought there was steel in it. If that was steel, <laughs> I'd be uh, probably detained for more questioning. But because it was wood, no. And that's the difference. That, that, that makes a big difference. You, what are you allowed to carry? What are you not allowed to carry? Yeah. That can be construed as a better weapon for self-defense because frankly speaking, once this is out, then you have a, uh, you know, the, the mindset there is going to be, yeah, yeah. I mean, right? Over here in the States. You're walking on the edge um, of legality. Yeah. I mean, most, I think there's only like one state if I'm if I'm correct, that you can actually mm. carry a sword. I think that's Texas. I think everywhere else, yeah. it's uh, it's illegal. But uh, I um I don't want to, you know just a little more on this. Um, Dean, oh, Eric, sure. Just to touch on it, it's for me. There's no blanket statement because your curriculum is dependent on your students and how and why yes. you're teaching. When I taught, I taught for over a decade on a college campus, and in the beginning, I was very like direct mindset coming from my instructor, from his instructor from Stockton. And Stockton's blue collar, farm worker, you know, they, they, the saying is rather be uh, judged by 12 than carried by six. Mm. And so the mentality is different. But then now I'm here at UC Berkeley with many students who are like the first generation of their family going to college, you know, a private university in, in the United States. At a certain point, I realized, especially when some of them start to get into altercations, it's irresponsible for me to ingrain mindsets 
that'll actually get them thrown in jail. Oh yeah, no, 100%. You know? yeah. And especially since most of them, they weren't learning. You know, self-defense was key, but also a lot of it was these were Phil Ams trying to get in touch with the heritage. So yeah, yeah. Each, each depends on it. And for me, blade, really, if you want to learn Filipino blades, go use utilitarian concept. And that's why I pulled this out. This is a, a Sese blade. This is a working bolo, you know, with a working sheath designed to have like, you know, where water falls out. But I do a lot of cutting. The edge has the damage from being used, and then you know I have to do file work to it. But that's how you learn how to cut. Yeah. For a certain generation of old men, it was like everybody Normal. could use rattan because that's how they sparred. That's how they tested it. Unless they're from a generation that actually cut people or have been cut by a blade. But depending on your audience, then definitely it can benefit, especially if you're doing class to separate it. And to dif differentiate yeah yeah i just for me um again i'm just speaking on my journey for me it really mm -hmm. provided clarity you know for me um and all that but and, thank and you also oh, Dave, just just excellent. quickly just sure. quickly um everybody here knows how to disarm a stick yeah Okay, try doing that with a live blade. <laughs> no, <laughs> this live blade, and see, uh, see if you don't get cut. No, okay. the snake, <laughs> the snake disarms. And yeah, no, no, I got you. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Best disarm for blade. Peace, dude. Peace. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Best disarm for the blade. Um, Peace. Yeah. <laughs> question four. All right, this is for you, Guru Elric. Edge to edge fighting with swords. So, really, so I'm going to base this on a couple of things. First off, from exposure to the moral fighting arts, where it's just a cultural disdain ban for edge to edge contact. The context I'll bring is I grew up in San Francisco in a street fight in San Francisco during my time in the 70s, early 80s. You were a, a punk, you were a bad sport, all kinds of things. If you got in a street fight, and you started to kick, and you definitely didn't take it to the ground. Now, I was allowed to kick because he said, oh, he's Chinese, he can kick. So it was like cultural things. Was, no, seriously, it was a cultural mandate about what was acceptable and what was a punk ass way to fight. But I was small, so I took people to the ground and I had to deal with everyone saying, I fight dirty. So most people mm -hmm. would never even do it. Now you watch a you know, in the last 10 years, we've seen street fights of just like women in Thailand who are not Muay Thai folks, but some stupid foreigner is like treating them like prostitutes. And you watch these women all roundhouse this guy till he drops the guy and they're roundhousing to the head. Why? Because that's part of the cultural context and the movement. So when we talk about moral arts, you don't do edge to edge contact. And then like, where does that translate? Also we go to all the way to Luzon, Paete, for the majority of it, those that still do a blade system, they don't do edge-to-edge -edge contact. They don't even want to do blocks. It's like a last resort. Of course, you go to edge-to-edge -to -edge if you have to do it. Now, I mentioned in the historical thing, uh, 19th century European saber fencing, which was taught to, at the end, there was 30,000 native Filipinos in the army, navy, Guardia Civil, carrying blades, they were actually teaching formal edge on edge blocks. So that's a lot of people learning those concepts. You know, it gets really convoluted in like how did that become stick arts, but that's where you get this blade culture, this context of edge to edge contact. And I know guys who've been practicing FMA blades as their primary thing for like decades. You look at their blades and you'll see live demos and there's like no edge damage. They might rarely make contact, but they're using other parts of the blade. There are systems now that do a lot of edge on edge contact. KI has like, for me, there's only one block that really uses straight 90 degree edge to edge. And there's somewhere there's like changing of blade angles, but that's later on from a European context, points from European blades. Uh, blades that might have a guard, but there's also techniques for when you're doing um, blade contact, 
but it's a whole different thing because you don't have the guard to protect your hand, it's like a whole defined skill set. So yes, it exists in FMA, but people saying like those are ancient techniques, that's bullshit. It's not part of the cultural context. And you look at the historical documents going back, a bolo was worth like a month's worth of salary for a regular bolo. You look at the craftsmanship of the old bolos are hundred years old, much nicer than what we have today, the mass produced stuff. But you're in like, our blades are high carbon. You got to oil these things every day. You got to sharpen it every day. They do a great job. They're very robust. But it's like, this is like, this is your baby. You're not going to just. Yeah, treat you're not going to ruin it. No. Yeah. But, I'll, you know, I'll say like, hey, I sparred against people who expose no weapon contact. But if you get up close on them. They will block, <laughs> and it might be edge to edge, because that yeah. would be stupid to take the hit. So yeah. let's be sacrifice their limb. I mean, yeah. But <laughs> training it is a whole different thing, and training it and saying it's traditional. Do some research and see, really, you know. Hmm. Did anybody else want to add to that? Well, the blade, the, the edge to edge contact, actually. It, you know, uh, well, what Elric says, I, I agree. I agree to that. And the only uh, moment that edge to edge happens is when you react to an attack. Okay, so here comes the attack, and you have no other choice. It's either you offer your face, or you you block it with your blade. That's the only time uh, edge to edge happens. But to fight with edge to edge all the time, that's, that's not gonna happen. No, I don't think anybody, I've never met anybody in the community that's advocated that. Right. I mean, back, not nothing. Back know, in the 90s, on, you know. it was huge. And I used to get into large arguments with people on the old Nyan Scream and Digest. And that's why I started mm -hmm. researching the HEMA stuff because at that time the HEMA community was saying no edge to edge. And now they realize that's bullshit. It's a huge part of European. Yeah, system. I mean, I. And they have I mean, maybe they. Eat, for it. Huh. Yeah, I just never. I mean, I've never met anybody that's advocated or, or said that. I mean, he had a moment, or for the sake of losing your head or a limb, like Ruhan Baki says. Well, then, yeah. Unfortunately, you'll probably present the edge as opposed to serving your head or a limb, whatever. Right. Did uh, Professor Khan, anybody else want to add to that? Yep. Okay. Um, question five. It's for you, Guru and Baki, and and then whoever else would like to add. The lost art of the native shield. Oh, okay. Uh, this one's very interesting. Let let yeah. me first show you how a native shield looks like. I hope you can see it. Oh, I can. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Let's see. Mm. So uh, the shields. In the old days, they're heavy, they're thick, okay? Why? Because uh, it's what you use to cover yourself, right? Mm. Now, when you have a shield, when you have a shield, you can only have one weapon. It's either you have one shield and one bolo or one shield and one spear. Because definitely, you cannot have a shield and bow and arrow at the same time. You cannot do that, all right? So you only have either a bolo or a spear with you. Now, um, there's coordination during the, uh, the war in the battlefields. All people who are wearing shields, they put themselves together because the war begins from a long distance, yeah? And all together with a shield, they can close the distance, yeah? So they use the shield to close the distance so they can finally fight it uh, over in, in, in the battlefield. Now, why was it lost? Uh, why was the art suddenly, you know, we, we lost the art? Simply because first, uh, the invention of firearms. Bullets can easily pierce in, in, into the, the shields. And uh, secondly, the, the discovery of better steel. You know, um, when there was, I'll show you another photo. When better steel, better metal were, uh, was discovered, men who are fighting in the battle started using harness. Look at this. 
You see that? Mm -hmm. You see? All right. Harness. Now, listen harness. to the word <laughs> harness. That was, uh, harness. this is where the word arnis came from. All right. Harness. harness. Because of this, you know, you don't need arms. a shield anymore mm -hmm. because you, you have, you simply have a metal around your arm. You see? Now, when the priests mm -hmm. are teaching the natives, okay, wear the harness, wear the harness and the escrima sword at the same time. You see? Escrima, harness. You see, there's no Kali there. All right, now just making a, just making a statement. Now, even when metals metal shields were were uh, started showing in the battlefields like this, still the strength of the enemy. You know the way they 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 chop the swords. Uh, you know the swords are like baseball bats with edge. So you can imagine how how <laughs> strong that is. So uh, now the popularity of shields is uh, simply, you know, we're, we're losing it. And then also there was uh, the way people fight. Holding the sword with two hands seems more effective in finishing the opponent quickly rather than holding a shield and using one arm. Uh, you got what I mean? Yeah. Even even the, the shoguns, the shogun, when they're fighting with katana, they don't need a shield because they need both hands in holding the sword. Right? So that, that's the reason why we, uh, we we no longer see the use of, uh, of the shields. But in FMA, in the modern times, you can still use it by applying it in your espada y daga. One stick would serve as your shield. Yes, the other one is your weapon. And what's good about this is that your supposed to be shield is also a weapon at the same time. Mm. I, I think uh, Professor Hakano has uh, something to say about that. I heard him once discuss this with me about okay. the. Uh, yeah, Prof. Mm, professor? Okay. I was trying to remember which discussion that was. <laughs> and it's a long time oh, no, ago. The, uh, the application, application of Espada y Daga, that's actually a shield. Oh, right yeah. There. Well, okay. Um, among other things, there's the historical context. Mumbaki is right. Firearms change everything. And remember, too, that over time, uh, even here, um, Elric could also point us to the other original Spanish sources. He has a lot of those. Okay, But think about it also. Even during the, from the Spanish colonial period onward, okay, firearms were increasingly becoming the weapon of choice, even in here. So you start in the beginning, and uh, even the Spaniards also still brought the shield, sword and shield system with them. Over time, more and more firearms became, uh, were brought in here. More and more people were trained in their use in marksmanship. And then shields just said became obsolete. The, the same trend that happened in Europe was happening here too. And uh, the, the, there are many interesting sources here, direct, uh, indirect and indirect sources. So for example, the, one of them would be, of course, let's say archival records of how people, how the garrisons were supplied, for instance. Uh, cold weapons, that's steel, uh, swords, hand-to-hand -hand weapons versus firearms, all right? Over time, if you, if you could read the original Espanol and see for yourselves just how much of it versus how much of it, that's an indicator of what was happening to the world of weaponry at the time. The Spadal Daga system, um, that, that's something else now that I've been thinking about ever since then because more and more European practitioners have been coming out with the own Espada y Daga approach. And while yes, in Atali, Mumbaki, in terms of the theory, while it is possible that yes, okay, if this was your uh, dagger and this was the sword, no? so like this. I think what, what is happening here now, and we'd have to, I've been rethinking about this also no? over time. What happens is, this, this becomes your analogy, your analog for the shield. 
and this one becomes your main weapon. You still your sword is still the sword, but the shield function of the knife. The, lo the big knife as a shield is markedly different from the shield that you have here, like this. It's very, very different. And I think the, the evolution of Spada Idaga in, from the Hema sense, the, 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 that's one area to look at because that's a very popular methodology here, especially with the different systems of Eskrima all the way from the Ilongo systems I studied to the Cebuano and even to the Luzon-based systems. Right, and it's um, more than that. The knife, the daga of the spada idaga, is more agile than that of a shield. Unlike a shield, which can be a battering ram, which can put punch forward, which can slam into you, and in fact, is a different kind of weapon all by itself. This one, because of its agility, is sneakier. And so, from some of the old men in the systems I studied, once told us, "Eto." This, this dagger is the traitor. It's not as upfront in your face as a shield is. It's more subtle and it goes around you here. So uh, one of my friends has a video online in which he said, this here paves the way for this. And that is an espada idaga concept, okay? This paves the way for this. And that's a different system altogether from the shield in which this one you covered until uh, get in here. So maybe one reason why it also disappeared, a practicality. The changing cultural environment at the time. I mean, um, certainly there are a lot of people who want to say, why why did we lose it? Why don't we have it anymore? What's gone? So there's a nostalgia for things that have gone. But the, the reality is our environments are changing. The physical environment is changing. The economic environment is changing. The cultural environment is changing. And by necessity, even the knowledge of how to use weapons is also changing. I mean, you know, you, you, why am I even uh, bothering with this? It's because it's a, I discovered it to be an integral part of my cultural identity, among other things. Of course, it's also practical and it's useful. And the most practical aspect of FMA I've ever discovered is how not to get into trouble. <laughs> now, <laughs> that is a shield. <laughs> okay, that is a shield. But before we go into that, let's get back to this. Yeah. The cultural environment changed. Shields are no longer a part of the what you needed to bring about as warriors. Shield, the knowledge of the shield is still practiced in many communities in the south in Mindanao, right? But again, you would have to be to know the right people in order to to know these kinds of things. You can still see some of some of the knowledge is preserved in a dance format. Okay as a performance then in the shield but remember the dance was based on the martial art so the echoes are there it's like a distant echo of a time past but it's not the same as it used to be in the time past so cultural change has happened and the shield has become obsolete yes the spada idaga it can serve as your shield a fire shield how big though is your dagger that's a technical question technical aspect here but now, as uh, ever since a conversation with Mumbaki, I've also come to realize that the the spada idaga should also be appreciated on its own terms. Certainly, the knife, the daga, is and um, can assist the sword. But in the right time, in the right place, the sword paves the way for the daga to enter. It's a matter of timing and training and perception, and of course, learning to see and developing the mindset for it. In much the same way that the shield is also a weapon. So sometimes, if you extrapolate that mindset, it's also possible that this sword clears the way for the shield to come in. And uh, there are many different kinds of shields, actually, which we don't have much of. Many of the better artifacts have been collected as souvenirs and have been sold to collectors abroad. But there's a wide variety of shields. The one I think Mumbaki showed us is the one from the north. Yeah. Right? Yeah, yeah that's the very, big one. Very old. And, yeah. and that's why you need only you need a spear or the axe and that one. But yes. from the south, from Mindanao and from the Visayas, there are different uh, sizes and varieties yeah. of shield work in there. Yeah. And so some of it, like a smaller one, a buckler, a one, you have yeah. more mobility with this. Right? right? Mm -hmm. 
So we have to consider also the wide variety of shields. But you know, in from hopologically speaking, unless you get into contact with somebody who's kept the living tradition alive, even if it's not used in dueling anymore. The most we can do when we pick up a shield is to reconstruct the movement based on what we have. Let's be honest about that. We're reconstructing something. We look at our anatomy. We look at the possibilities here. And we look at the cultural context, always bearing in mind that there are some things we might not be able to do simply because we don't know how to do them. That's it. Yes. And the, okay. the only people who are the only people who are using the shields now, uh, especially in Manila when there's a riot, yeah, just the police, <laughs> the policemen, yeah, because they, they need it to cover themselves without hurting the civilians. So they need a long shield and bomb squad, bomb squad. Those are the guys who are using the shields actively up to this day. That's the. Uh... <laughs> I think one of the big issues is there's always a, a mix up and collapse of what's yeah. traditional. And then yes. what is living art? Yeah, and, I agree with you know, that. What we have today, and you know, actually all all of us here who've trained in the Philippines, you know, our journey begins back in the 90s or earlier, right? And we got this generation of old men who lived through World War II. So we got living arts. It was a, an amalgamation of what they had to live through and what could be used like really historically the main weapon in the Philippines was the spear, but you couldn't legally carry a spear anymore during the American colonial period or, mm -hmm. you know, in the post American colonial period, because that was clearly a weapon of war and they didn't want people carrying that. And at that point they had firearms. So the spear went away and the shield went away much earlier. Um, and the records I've seen, the oldest in the 1850s, so 19th century, that's the last time you see large battles. There's like battles with over 500 Visayan warriors all using sword and shield, fighting along Spanish troops using firearms, all attacking different places in, in Holo and other parts of Mindanao. But like, you know, for mass training, they were using like a Captain America round shield with a hand grip and something down here, which you also see, like Mark just talked about, up north you have the Igorot shields where it's held in the hand. It's almost like a buckler, but much larger. It might have two or three uh, points where they could hit someone or capture someone in the head and then chop or stab with their spear. But those are, you know, not many people have access to that. And it's part of traditional ways, Igorot, Moro, but uh, that's the old way. And that's where you would make contact with the weapon, use your shield. But what we've inherited is self-defense methods, part of the martial culture of the Philippines. But people trying to say this is ancient stuff. I'm like, that's not how we fight. You're going to use, learn how to fight with just 28-inch stick or 28-inch blade against a guy with a, a shield and a spear? <laughs> Good luck. <laughs> Nope. That was fantastic. Um, uh, Mom says, Tino, we got uh, your next, sir. Um, so this is kind of two parts. We got FMA empty hands versus boxing, and then, of course, so-called dirty boxing. <laughs> okay. Say it, Manong. Come on. <laughs> okay. Okay. Say it, okay, here we go. <laughs> I think he's frozen, no? Yeah. I think something's wrong with his Hello? Uh huh. All right. Here now, Mang Mangtini, you can talk. Oh, then it froze. <laughs> uh oh, that's when it's going to get interesting. <laughs> um, well, let's see if he um if he comes back in uh, right away. Yeah. There. Go figure, huh? Just when it's his question. Something's wrong with his uh, headset. I can hear the. 
Yeah, it was it was really long. Vinny, maybe unplug and plug back in your headset. How's that? Perfect. Right, good, okay. Good. okay. Perfect. Uh, let me go back first to the the, the, the shield uh, of the Hispanic Cubanos. We call it Taming. Mm -hmm. There are actually two uh, two spears in use during that time. One is the shorter sapang about 40 inches, 48 inches. It was basically used for thrusting, shield and the sapang or short shield. The last one, I know who we interviewed for the book, who know, knew how to handle the sapang was uh, Manong Huyan Gukong. And the other kind of shield were used as a projectile, the longer one. Uh, and the Moro, the Moro land is called this Bujak. So uh, pre-Hispanic uh, Cebuanos uh, really were heavy into armor made of uh, mesh rattan uh, strips and helmets uh, of coconut husks. So um, that's as far as I can go uh, in regard to the use of the spear, the shield. So uh, next question was it, what, what is it again, uh, Dean? <laughs> yeah, so, okay, so it's kind, of, <clears throat> it's kind of two parts. So whatever you want to yeah. tackle first. So the first part, FMA at the hands versus boxing, and then of course, the so-called dirty boxing. Okay. Um, FMA and the hands, um, I, would, uh, I would assume uh, that uh, this came uh, right after World War II because um, as um, what I've said uh, before that uh, transferability of weapons to empty hands is, is uh, not, you know, um, just uh, counterintuitive, you know, because uh, if you transfer blade to empty hand fighting, it's more angular uh, uh, movements in the strikes, more telegraphic. So um, during the 1950s or, or the early, um, right after World War II, many of the uh, FMA clubs in Cebu, practically all of them were into the Japanese arts. Even the, the old Kanyete brothers, uh, the brothers of uh, EGM, Manuel Kaku Kanyete, were, they all had black belts in judo. And at that time, um, Skrima training was relegated as just a supplementary art because everyone wanted to get into karate and judo. So, Practically all of the people who were into scream and the Filipino martial art had to get ranking in the Japanese arts. So that's how the empty hands evolved. It's not uh, pure FMA, but uh, a blend of the some of the, the judo and the Japanese arts uh, incorporated into present day FMA. Like my first instructor, Manuel Liloy Kabagno, most of his moves were uh, judo locks and and, and throws. I, I don't see anything <laughs> that's purely uh, coming from this clima or FMA. So, um, take, take for example, my, my first karate instructor, I was only sporting uh, Dr. Ben Marampa, who had a black belt, he was our chief instructor at the YMCA Dujo. All the rest of my the black belts there, like uh, Benjamin Simbahu, they were into Balintawa. Practically all of them. Nick Ilazar was in karate <laughs> during his early days back in the 60s. Uh, Jim Babit Boada was into boxing. So those are two different animals, you know, empty hands and weapons. Uh, like what uh, Professor Bote said, this uh, two different specializations, you know. You can't, uh, you have to train, uh, you know, uh, concentrate on one and Concentrate on weapons arts. Now going back to dirty boxing. Okay, this, um, there's even one uh, notion that uh, FMA or the Filipino martial arts influenced this term boxing. There's no truth to that. That's another uh, pile of BS. Uh, boxing was introduced to the country by Americans. The brothers Eddie Tate and Stewart and uh, Frank Churchill, they were more bootleg they held, they promoted the bootleg boxing bouts in Metro Manila as early as 1902. So uh, all the dirty boxing that you see on YouTube, uh, you know, they're promoted by these guys into Panantukan, uh, 
it all happened in the ring. <laughs> it all, uh, boxing was already the dirty uh, from the early start uh, as a bare knuckle fights, right? <laughs> what could be more dirty than that? And um, I would like to mention uh, the boxing trainer of the, the late uh, gym, Tony Diego, Stanislao Del Campo. He goes by the ring name of Tani Campo. He's a good friend of my dad. Uh, I come from the boxing capital of the country. We produce more uh, world champions than any other ethnic group in the entire country. <laughs> Just to enumerate, plus Elorde, Mani Pacquiao was in one of Frank Cidinho, Jerry Peñalosa, Dodi Boy Peñalosa, his brother Jonathan Peñalosa. So many of them, General Casemiro, who, uh, the most recent champion, Nonito Donaire, they're all Cebuano Bisaya. So uh, I can speak with uh, confident authority that no such thing as dirty boxing right now being peddled all around the internet, like as Panantukan or all that uh, shit, you know. And uh, one more thing, um, Tani Campo was uh, the boxing uh, teacher of uh, Tony Diego. Of course, he, he taught him the dirty thing that happened inside the ring. And one of those guys, my reference persons, was the former welterweight champion, uh, Eliares. He also once trained us back in the 70s. And uh, uh, Eliares described to us how he knocked out Carlos Ortiz with an elbow. <laughs> the referee, he was, was uh, out of sight of the referee. So after he threw, I think uh, Eli was a uh, South Pole, after he threw a right hook, he converted his throw to the elbow. And uh, was what Eli told us, uh, that's how I avenged his, the defeat of Plasi Lodi and knocked him out with an elbow. <laughs> and the fight took place in Puerto Rico, of all places. So uh, some of the things, uh, like uh, I saw this on YouTube, uh, uh, the, the elbow bump to the chin as you flinch. <laughs> it, all, it all happened in the ring. There's no special dirty boxing that's outside of the ring. It's all happened. Even the, the palming and the nose, it all happened in the ring. The headbutt, the neck grab, Sandy Sadler. I, I recently posted a video of Sandy this fight of, between Sandy Sadler and uh, Plus Elorde. So dirty boxing days, 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 way, way back as early as the 19th, uh, we started the 20th century. So it's a myth, uh, it's a myth altogether. So uh, one of the things that I found uh, the motivation for, you know, coming up with this thing, this, most of these things uh, come out in the, in the USA as a brand extension. It's a brand, mm. you know. Okay, we specialize, specialize in panuntukan and dirty boxing. These are illegitimate, non-existent martial arts here in Cebu, where I come from, the capital of boxing in our country. So I can speak with authority. So I think that's it. Unless uh, there are other questions you need to clarify. So well, probably, they... probably, uh, we we can put it this way. Anything that is not allowed inside the ring, <laughs> that's dirty. That's yeah. dirty tricks, right? Dirty tricks. And uh, <laughs> if, if you look at the Olympic gloves, you know, the Olympic gloves, it, it has a white uh, part right here because uh, you are only allowed to hit your opponent with that part, not with this, not, not with the thumb, not with the hammer, only with this part to keep the sport clean. So anything that is not in the ring, that's definitely dirty. Supposing boxing gloves in the old days, the thumb is detached from, from this part, you know? And because of Filipinos using the thumb to gouge the eyes of their opponents. Yes, it, it was, uh, Filipinos are the reasons why the thumb was stitched to the glove like this. And now when you see the boxing gloves, uh, the thumb is no longer detached. And also, uh, during, uh, I think, until 90s or early 2000s, boxing gloves have laces here. But because, again, because of Filipinos using those laces to, uh, you know, to, rub. Uh, to smother the faces of, of their opponents, 
it has turned into a Velcro. And then now they're wrapping it with with. Oh, they're uh, taping it up. They're taping, they're taping it now. Yes, mm -hmm. blame the Filipinos for that. But dirty boxing. Uh, well, Manongpini said it. <laughs> yeah, uh, Casey, here we go. So then, if was this um, Montino? Do you think it was a marketing, um, a marketing ploy on the Western aspect, Western part of the world? Yes. Yeah. I think it's over. Also, this enthusiasm to make it more than it is. Yeah. Um, Correct. I don't yeah. know what I missed, but it's like in the 90s, who was available here in Metro Manila, you had people who came from Japanese martial arts, Kung Fu, and there was a drive, especially coming from, you know, the Precious Brothers with Modern Arnis, and also the Kinetes to make uh, FMA palatable here in the Philippines. So this is totally different from what's happening in the United States. But those who didn't go commercial or if they were teaching, they're teaching in a park or in the backyard, these were old dirty fighters. So they had all kinds of dirty tricks. Some of them might have knew boxing, knew those things. But uh, the issue of making like this old ancient Filipino art, mm. that's yeah. where it gets, gets a little bit, uh, the stories, it's like too much hyperbole, too much yeah, uh, marketing. marketting, making up stuff. But yeah, the Western dirty yeah, tricks uh, did exist. You know, did exist. It existed inside the ring. <laughs> yeah, Nothing yeah, yeah, right, right, inside, right, right, inside, yeah. right inside the ring. Until now, yes. But the, the I guess yeah. What, what was Specialized it? Specialized art. The the issue comes here is it's kind of like folks in the United saying this is the way it is. These absolute absolute statements, and then it's offensive to. Like, hey, over here in the Philippines, like, no, those are the badass boxers. We're gonna listen to them because if I get in the ring, they're gonna kick my ass. And then this is what we do over here in the sticks. We're gonna, you know, people have their different lanes, but then outside of the context of the Philippines, it gets collapsed into this is all of FMA. And that's where it, it, it gets, the claims get kind of ridiculous. Yeah, and, think, you know, I mean, and there's modern systems. So people are developing stuff now. Yeah, I think, um, you know, before we jump to the next question, that's always kind of bothered me, like, um, you know, and I hate to pick on the U.S., but a lot of this stuff does, in fact, has derived from the U.S. when they actually claim about historic information, all that, to con you know, to <laughs> contend against actual truth presented by you guys, like, and then when they and when some of these guys have never even been to the Philippines, that's that's been kind of awesome for me. Um, next question: Who will Mbaki? Then after that, we get Professor Jocano involved. Um, Dumak is a superior grappling art. Dumak <laughs> is a superior <laughs> grappling art. No, it's not. Never. Okay. 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 <laughs> it's child's play. Child's play. And you, you will see a lot of videos now in YouTube saying, oh, Filipino martial arts, the dirty grappling or the dangerous grappling arts. Come on. I see jujitsu in there. I see wrestling. Oh, wrestling, I've seen wrestling. YouTube videos. And it's like pure BJJ. <laughs> it is. It is. Yeah, yeah. All, it is. all these Filipinos who's trying to, to market Japanese art, the Greco art into... Uh, part of an FMA curriculum. Come on, guys, stop doing this. Because uh, we, we look stupid in the eyes of many people, except, of course, in the eyes of those who will believe you. All right? Mm. Supposing one, one film in, in YouTube, a guy was forced to wrestle a carabao. I, I'm not sure if you guys saw this. I did, I did. In, yeah, yeah, yeah. in yeah, yeah. the Philippines, Okay, let's get it straight. In the Philippines, yeah, yeah. arabaos, cows, horses, these are working animals. Yeah. We value them. We value them because they yeah, give us, like, they help us. Right. They give us money. Okay, they, go, they right, give so us you're work. you're going to risk they, injuring them. <laughs> you don't. <laughs> Whoever invented that history that Filipinos are wrestling carabao, say, come on. Stop doing this, okay? It deserves a soccer punch. <laughs> <laughs> it 
If you have a question, Guru Mbagi. Yeah. I have a question. I know as far as FMA concern, Dumag and all that, obviously you're alluding to a myth and where it's, you know, combat judo, this and that, or other stuff, or Buddha, whatever, and all that. However, though, it is, but like, in other words, like I look at like Ron's Kung Tao and all that, but again, we really, in all fairness, we can't put that under the lens of Dumag because that being more moral oriented. Am I, am I wrong? If so, where am I going wrong? Uh, actually, I'm going to give uh, a story real quick. So all right, all right. go ahead. Elric. In in 99, uh, Guru Yashir uh, came and stayed with me in the United States. And I had him um, actually, me and one of my good friends, we had broken off training with my instructor in 96. After we separated from him, I still continued with FMA. He got deep into Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu with Alf Gracie. We had another friend who trained mm -hmm. out of uh, Willie Cahill's gym. Willie Cahill is a former... Uh, U.S. Olympic coach, and on any night of the week, you can find like you know five to ten former Olympians on his mats on his black belt classes. And um, anyway, so ninety nine, my friends already a blue belt on his track. You know he's been trained three years on his track to get um, you know his purple belt, and he meets uh, Guri Ashir, and they actually roll. And Guru Yashir was actually able to tap him out with techniques my friend didn't recognize. And this is a guy who's a blue belt under Half Gracie. Now, mind you, he's only a blue belt. If he was a purple belt, maybe he would have tapped out Yashir instantly. But my point being is that's the morals and they have a tradition. Traditionally, they would start as babies and they do exercises on their back, then learning stuff on their belly. And it was a lifetime of learning. And then he was, you know, in the field during the Marcos era, actually applying his stuff. But that's not what we're seeing. We're seeing videos of people like in the early days of YouTube, you see a video coming up on uh, of some art somewhere here in the Philippines. And you're going like, dude, you're not even changing anything. That's Dan in the Santos tape three, applying all the same techniques. And then now you're doing, uh, you know, uh, Larry Hartzell's video over here. So it was, you could see it was a made up thing. And what people are calling Dumo, if you look at it, if the techniques are the same, exactly the same as like what Mumbaki is saying, Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, basic wrestling techniques, that's where it goes off. And in the Christian Filipino areas, yeah, in some areas there were traditions of regional wrestling, but they didn't have ground techniques. They didn't have ground submissions. It was submission by throwing. It was submission by getting on top, but that's like, we're seeing something totally different. And, and the, the BS about it is what the real issue is. You know, once again, it's like this hyperbole and now marketing. And then, hey, if you're gonna say it's a modern art, I, I have no problem with that. And if you can yeah, fight with it, yeah. I have no problem with that. Exactly. I get you. Yeah, yeah. But if I want to get my ass kicked, I'm going to go fight an MMA guy with real wrestling and real Brazilian jiu-jitsu judo experience because yeah. it's a, a, a whole different thing. <laughs> yeah, just from people who are look, watching, the reference to the Anasano blend, which was my first exposure to FMA, there, the Dumont there was a lot of push and pull. You get on the lower form, fulcrum, I mean, and all that. And yeah, I mean, we, um, uh, you know, I bought into it. <laughs> no, no, but these movements, Dean, these movements that uh, Guru Dan showed, showed you, uh, these are from Kuntao also. These are from the Moro arts. But the Christians don't have a grappling art. We, well, that, we that, that's, have... that's what my initial question was to you. Like, yeah. okay, fine, FMA. However, though, because in the Anasano blend, there's a huge Lacosta piece. And as we all know, Lacosta did go convert to Muslim to get some Sila Kuntao. Yes. Brought to empty hands. So I'm guessing that's where Guru Dan got it from. So that's why I wanted to make the compare and contrast. Yes. So it's safe to say there was grappling per se and the moral stuff, but far as the FMA, quote unquote FMA, Christian, obviously not. The for like uh, Guru Elric mentioned something. I'm gonna go, 
get, it might didn't get haters and stuff, but talking to the old folks in Stockton in the nineties, no one, including Lacoste used Kali. No one, you know, these are stories that are coming out later, but then here's the other thing. I got some videos of old guys here in the Philippines. They made up stories. They say they train with the Moros. They, and you got to realize it's like that's part of the culture making up shit. And but the, I I have, you know, that's why it's like you had uh, Gracia Casillas, and then you got some of the other folks who had exposure to these old guys in Stockton Correct. back in the eighties before my time. Correct. Talk to them and see what they say about Lacoste. What they say about what people were actually calling the things back then. The and also, you know, people who were back, you know, in the in Santo Academy in the old days, in the eighties and, er, and earlier, what were they actually calling this stuff? Was was it being attributed to Lacoste at the time, or was it being uh, attributed to Villabrille, or was it being yeah, uh, attributed a... to Ancient Gabales? So the narrative changes. No, I, I and so that's where. Like, I appreciate and love the stories and they're fun to listen to, but when it's being now told to us, this is the, the actual history. And then we have a new generation telling me, you don't know your history? I'm like. Yeah, that's gotta be. That's, that's just spark. <laughs> just, no, just to make it clear. Just, yeah, just, just to make it clear, okay. Yeah. It's not to say that Filipinos don't have a grappling art. We have a grappling art, we have wrestling art, but it's not as how you see jujitsu is judo no, or Greek wrestling no, is no. we have one in the north it's called the boltong and then you have boltong. the Kuntao. yes and you have the Kuntao. other than that we don't have the dumog we don't have the okay. dumog historically no we don't have that okay all right I think it's more, more like the mongolian mongolian wrestling that we have yes dumog. yes welcome so uh, question there's one uh, there's one uh, guy dumo guy uh, no less than chief alvin aguilar <laughs> took part in busting this myth because he was showing uh, this do move, uh, move. Then uh, I showed a video to my son, Jay, who's studying BJJ. And he recognized the technique. It's called Pumo Plata. It's a very complex uh, submission technique. Actually, it's very low percentage in uh, UFC. In fact, there's only one uh, UFC fight where the Pumo Plata was you know, successfully Completed the uh, submission. So, uh, Chief Alvin Aguilar uh, uh, confirmed that he's an only plata in <laughs> Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. All yes. right, that was that was a uh, that was good. All right, question eight, uh, Professor Jocano, which blade was often seen in the Philippine battlefields? Oh boy. Hmm. I think it would be Eric who should be looking at that because he has the more. Uh, he's done. It's done a deep dive into the archival work necessary for it. He he's got access to the well original uh, records. I think between the five of us here, Eric has advantage because he can read Espanol. I think he can read and speak Espanol, so he can look at records. Hey, my brand. Okay, but he has that one, and it would be better for him to and to take the question because that's the one that he has a lot of background work on. Yeah, Eric, please. So, um, first off, is like historically, it was the spear. Now, but at the same time, anyone who won the battle, they had a field knife. And you can see certain uh, paintings, certain illustrations, and then you're gonna have, you know, you know, everyone carrying something small like this with them, but in the other hand, they'd have a spear and a shield. Um, or they'd have a small blade like that, and then they have, you know, a rifle with a bayonet that's about this long. These are like, you know, what we see a lot of this is 19th century, and then stuff going back further. One key thing in the Spanish documents, and this was very interesting, I was looking at it, there's a key word, Taliban, T-A-L-I-B-O-N. And I don't know why that term was used, but you find this in multiple 19th century documents uh, 
referring to the military and also specifically Guardia Civil and then the Quadrillos. Quadrillos were localized police forces that worked at the provincial level. And um, if you go to the American period, another researcher, um, uh, Raimundo Lucero Valdez, he found some documents in showing that the Americans also use the exact same term, but the Americans add on war bolo. So the point being is there were regional fighting blades, but the blades would have been custom made or not even custom made. They were just made in the local areas. So what they used in one area was different from another area. And this is a, a grave, not a grave, it's a big domain of ignorance and FMA for me that people don't realize, oh, this is actually the regional blade. Like, I'm not gonna name names, but I'm gonna say one martial art, American instructor made hundreds of blades saying, hey, this is the blade of our instructor system but the instructor is from Negros, Silagainon, and the blade that he's been passing off to everybody is a well-known Batangas blade. And they all, you know, all these people are buying this blade thinking, oh, this is the traditional blade of our system. But it's like, no, it's one where he found a group of Pandais who can make it in mass. <laughs> but that's not actually the old blade of their system. Um, Talibong uh, is a well-known old fighting combat blade. Um, and, you know, Pakiti Terse is known for the uh, Ginunting, but really that goes to the, I'm gonna mispronounce this, Pinoganon. Uh, Hokano, do you know the correct pronunciation or somebody else of that, but it's an older fighting blade, but also a working blade. Leite has the Zanzibar. Um, in Luzon, the, the Hon Palai is a famous old fighting blade. So there's different fighting blades, or the Pinuti is the famous one from uh, the Cebuano, Visayan speaking regions. So it's different for different areas. And that same name, in some areas, it's a generic term for blades. In another area, it's a very specific handle shape, very specific blade shape. And then you have to do the research because then you'll see, oh, is the modern system still designed for that blade or is it not? And there are some folk systems that still know it and use it, but most of them it's like, their system's no longer designed for the traditional war blade of their region. And in many areas, those war blades have stopped being made for over a hundred years. In some places it still is. Still Pandais making Chris's and Barongs. There's still Pandais making Zanzibar. There's still Pandais making beautiful Pinuti and other Cebuano blades. There's still Pandais in Luzon making beautiful Dahon Palai. But there's other blades that like Garab, uh, the, I'm not, there's other blades like the Talibong for certain regions that the real fighting version that hasn't been made like in a hundred years. People are trying to bring it back, but Mostly gone for some of them. Um, Professor Jocano, how about this? Which blade was often seen in the amok ceremonies and encounters? What, what do you mean? Oh, among the ceremonies and encounters. Which, what are, what's the well, comments? What the encounters? Amok. Oh, that. Uh, the amok okay. encounters Go. and the Hermantados encounters. Mm hmm. Okay. Which, uh, which uh, play was often seen, I guess? Let me see. All right. Um, the question, the whole question about the Hulomentado is a rather sensitive one, right? There's a bigger, 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 bigger cultural context behind that. And one that is best that if we have our Bangsamoro friends weigh in on that issue, if uh, they get to see this interview, it would be great if they would also comment on this. Uh, basically, Okay, from what I've known and I've spoken with Bangsamoro friends, from my teacher, and from the historical sources that I could get hold of. Curamentado is a uh, Spanish term, okay? And it's not a, something that's uh, from the local. In fact, for the Tausug, the best term would be called a parang sabil, if that is the correct term. Yeah, so the parang sabil, 
and it is like a jihad and the the best way to describe it as it was then described by outsiders mind you by outsiders was that the the man who goes on the parang sabil uh, is going uh, has to prepare himself then he on the appointed day of the parang sabil he goes out and carries uh, whatever blade he has with him and this is important because it's whatever he has with him and then he goes to kill as many of the non-muslims as he can find before he himself eventually is killed okay. now firstly there is a context uh, for that um you the screen it's a it, it is one form of ad- bit, yeah. okay. but not many of the and not all of the Bangsamoro people necessarily endorse that, nor do they look with favor upon all of it. It's a rather extreme form. Okay? It's rather extreme in one sense. And that's why I said it's also kind of the uh, sensitive issue because we find this mentioned all the time. And so it's like uh, most, the Muslims or the, the Moros, the Bangsamoro people who go na parang sabil and then they, they get into uh, killing as many people again until they shut down. And most of the colorful stories are from the American colonial period. And that is an important context there. Where would this be placed in? Remember that most of the stories come from that American colonial period. Okay? And why did it take so many people, so many men shooting them until they finally collapsed before they got near the officers? And then in some of the more lurid versions of the stories, um, they were... They got close, and at least in one account, they managed to hack at the commanding officer. But the key element in these stories is this. The presence of those um, colonial forces and the parang sabil, the jihad, so to speak. Always. They don't, uh, the, the common element here is that there is an outside occupying force in that town. Okay? There's an outside occupying force in that town, whether it was the Spaniards who never did manage to get much of a foothold into Mindanao, except maybe in some key cities, like in Zamboanga, for example, right? And then with the Americans managed to come in after making several treaties with the local sultans and that they began to break them as soon as it was safe to do so. Okay, there's some very interesting academic discussions on this history here, but you have to consider the bigger picture behind why this occurred. And almost always, it's against an outsider, an outsider, an invader, somebody who was not well thought of. Yet at the same time, not all of the uh, Bangsamoro agreed that this was an acceptable form of jihad, because there are, according to some of my friends here, who told me there are a number of different kinds of jihad one of the lowest one is that when you go out to kill somebody the highest one is when you conquer yourself and become a better force so you better become a positive influence upon the community then you don't need to kill anyone right that's a two that's a context here so that's one of the lowest ones and at least one friend privately whispered to me when I asked him about this, because it was the analogy to the Malay word amok, meaning going out of your head, flipping out of this, except that this one was more ceremonial in nature. He said that many of these people who go on this sudden rampage actually want to die. But since suicide is forbidden, it's this uh, phenomenon in the law enforcement world. It's called third party assisted uh, suicide. Okay, so get somebody else, they go around and kill as many people, make so much trouble that they have to be killed because they really want to die, actually. Now, that one is different, too, from the uh, Parang Sabil I mentioned because the second one happens, too. And it's the more luridly described and it's the more exoticized and it's often unfairly associated with many of the Bangsamoro people. But in fact, it happens here in Metro Manila. It happens anywhere in the big urban cities. Right? Because of the stress of life, some people just crack and they decide to go try to kill as many people as they can before they get killed themselves. And it happens anywhere. Okay? So it's not just specific to Bangsamoro people. No, so I don't, say that don't uh, 
let, let's not use that. You know, do away with that image because it's unfair to them. It's unfair to my friends in the Bangsamoro world. Now, what kind of blade? That depends. Do you have a barong? Do you have a kris? What did the what did the man about to embark on the parang sabil have with him? That's it. It doesn't have to be specific. Only a single consecrated. Whatever you have with you. Why? Remember too that even uh, the choices of blades of weapons is also shaped by economics. Okay, economics. The people are can afford or not afford certain kinds of weapons. So when they go on these things, here you go. Okay. Now uh, that's one thing that I think we have to consider. Of course, the Chris is almost always associated with this sort of thing. But how much of that was the journalistic uh, tendency, and how much of that was actually for real? Um, it would like to see maybe in some museum somewhere, an artifact of a weapon that was used in an actual encounter with this. But um, I, I went into a great deal of uh, talking about this because I just wanted to come up and say that uh, let's not get stuck on just one thing only. Okay? Um, you, have to, you have to consider the bigger context in which these things happen and why they happen. No, that's great. it. Sorry, I talked too much already. No, that's no, good. No, 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 no. no. Uh, I want to add a little bit to it. So, because you're using the term amok. Uh, yeah. The sci fi geeks, the most famous uses in uh, Star Trek season two episode, Amok oh, Time. Oh, oh yeah. Stock, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Back to Vulcan. Yeah. Uh, but Amok uh, ended up being used for all of the Philippines. So, it was also so associated with any type of attacks yeah. where. Uh, typically, during the American colonial period, you have the uh, Philippine Constabulary, which, I mean, you, the American image of like the American Rangers traveling to the Wild West and then putting down bandits or, you know, Native Americans or Mexicans. There you go. That was the experience of the Philippine Constabulary. By 1935, mm -hmm. one in seven uh, people who were in the Philippine Constabulary were dead. That's how dangerous it was to actually serve in the Philippine Constabulary. And so they're going into banded areas. So once again, depending on what part of the Philippines they were in, then they're getting attacked by the local blades. Uh, pretty well documented is their, um, what happened to them in uh, Samar. So then we're talking about, you know, Talibong and those of the Pulahanes attacking them. That was like the main blade they were using over there. But then in, uh, like the second case that Professor O'Connor was talking about, like, hey, yeah. I'm going to choose the way I'm going to die. We know that, you know, you have my wanted picture up all over the place. I'm going to choose to die this way. And the, like one of the most famous cases of that was uh, Jikiri, well-documented in um, Hurley's uh, Jungle Patrol. Oh, yeah, yeah. That, yeah and, yeah. you know, that's where you have the case of, you know, he said, you want me? In a month's time, I'm going to be on this mm -hmm. island and you can go get me there. <laughs> yeah. and so, you know, he told the, the Americans exactly where to go get them. And they actually had to go inside. And then it's well documented, like the damage they did with both Chris's, but mostly yeah. Barong's. The Barong mm -hmm. is like a preferred weapon of the Tao Sug. And, yeah. uh, and the damage those things do, it's well documented in both there Spanish 19th century mm -hmm. And then the American colonial period, those things. No, uh, heavy, big spines. Cut through a body. <laughs> yeah. No, no, big, yeah, yeah. Um, all right, uh, question 10. Uh, whoever, um, Long Slice Tino, if you'd like to correct to this, Karate came from Kali. <laughs> sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Peace. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Oh, okay. Oh, I saw that video of Jesse Etang, and one of his sources there uh, from Modern Arnes. You know, Modern Arnes, everyone knows, traces lineage to Professor Remy Presas. And the Presas brothers, like what I said earlier, almost all the Filipino martial arts instructors uh, during the 50s and the 60s had. In ranking and had the black belts in karate and judo and aikido. That's just to you know to reinforce uh, their legitimacy and their you know 
professionalism in, into the martial arts because way way back 1960s uh scream artists is it's a backyard uh, art you have to get into the you know you have to get into the legitimate uh, judo karate aikido judo uh, dojos just to gain access to students that's how bad the situation was but back in the 60s so there's such thing as a universal truth in uh, martial arts you know movements can have you know similarities because unless uh, you find someone with four legs and four arms that's the time you say oh this, is this particular art that technique is unique to the system so that that's really funny and uh, <laughs> I don't think it warrants any more argument because this, this is a stupid idea. You know, just to get attention, uh, subscribers, please like and subscribe to my channel. That's, uh, that's the reason. Yeah. <laughs> Nothing else. I say something. Sure, please. Sorry, sorry, Timmy. No, I'm uh, jumping in. Look, the the biggest part there, the, the you know the most striking part there was he was comparing, right? Uh, this movement from karate. One, two, three, four. One, two, okay. Uh, one, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. All right. Now look at, you know, uh, in karate that has its, karate's roots really come from, uh, Okinawan karate at least, huh? it has its roots from Chinese martial arts. Yeah. Especially southern style Fukien uh, white crane. Okay. Now here, the movement in question is one, two, three, four. Okay. Now here's what. In the kung fu, I have learned uh, specifically five ancestors with Tocha kung fu. Look at this. One, two, okay, three, four. In the language of the style, the teacher, my teacher taught me, this is Kim to grab, Kyo, lift, this one, Kai to press down, Cheng to punch. The whole training sequence is called Kim Cheng, okay? Kim, pa, pa, pa. Now, okay, now one version, okay, one, two, three, four. Very, very little difference between the two, right? Now, the, the root here is much closer because the purpose of this movement is to teach you one, if you're doing this here, it means you go to the outside, avoid him, you pad the attack, press it out here. This one here is to make sure that he doesn't come back at you. It is a parry and a bridge. In fact, the, the um, one way to appreciate this is if you could slap this attack aside and hit him right away, boom. Okay? If you could train really hard enough, well, you, you just would increase your chances of surviving. Now, it's also present in uh, FMA systems. Okay? I can't say where the closest probably is from the uh, drills found in modern Arnis, which also has its roots in Balintawak. But because yeah. I'm not a modern practitioner or Balintawak is Krima, I, I'm not going to be off, going off the deep end and say something about that. But it is pretty good. One, two, three, four. You know, the, the, look at this here. If you, have, if you practice a Spada Idaga system, hmm. all right, look. One, two, three, four. So, one, two, three, four. So, it doesn't, uh, variations can be made to exist for this. And, you know, they are an acceptable training template. But to say that it could have come from here, that's too much of a stretch because there's not enough documentary evidence to support that. There's just a similarity of movement. Whereas there is more documentary evidence to support the notion that karate is derived from uh, southern Chinese martial arts. And in fact, there's, there's a lot, there's a ton of videos there, there's uh, historical sources where people like Jesse Enkamp himself has gone back to China to look for it.
The fact that the singularity is there is very striking. But guess where I learned that dream too? This version here. Sila. Okay. Uh, Guru Yasser knew several systems of Silat, and apart from the indigenous ones he taught me, he also taught me some training techniques from Indonesian Silat. And this one is from Chimande. Okay. This is from Chimande, Pari. Okay, lift, press down, punch, Pari. See, the same thing, the, the same movement, the same drill. So the, the karate come from Silat? Uh, 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 let's not go that far either, right? No. Does karate come from Kung Fu? Oh, definitely. There's more there. But unless yeah. you have more of this fill in the gaps sort of thing, you can't really say that. Now, the, the, the reason that video is so striking because of the question that he praised it. Did karate really come from Kali? <laughs> okay. Did it? Was it a possible? And it's always a question. Was it? But it does not say it does. But it got your attention, didn't it? Right? It yeah, worked for its purpose. Yeah, can't argue that. <laughs> well, what I think the modern practitioner, especially since this year everyone's learning or studying more and watching yeah. more on, on, on online, especially YouTube yeah. and Facebook, is that uh, especially for channels that are popular, it's the art of clickbait. And people look at that negatively, but it's like, <laughs> yes. no. These are people who are, that's their career, and they're specifically creating titles designed to get the most amount of sharing, the most amount of viewing, yeah. the uh, best ability to show up into it. And so people need to realize that the title, that's its purpose. It's often yeah. its only purpose or its primary purpose. So you need to realize that you need to watch the whole video before you react to it. Sometimes it's the actual video will say something very, very different. But yeah, Ooh. karate, Ooh. Okinawa karate comes from Southern Chinese martial arts, but they have made it their own. And Japanese yes. karate is a whole nother creature that's evolved into something else now. That's it. All right. Um, we have, depending on time, we got one last, we got one more question and then um, I did see some questions throughout the thread, but I may. It's so 154 direct. comments. Jeez. <laughs> I, know. I may. I, know. I, 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 I may direct um, some of their questions to you guys directly, but we'll get to that in a few minutes. But for now, the last question: For those who are promoting themselves in the FMA, are you really selling self-defense? So who would like to take a we haven't heard from Guru Mambaki in a bit, so let's start with him. <laughs> yep. All right. <laughs> uh, let's be brutal now. Okay. Bring it on. Uh, I'm sure a lot of <laughs> Bring it on. I'm sure a lot of instructors are watching this, ma masters even. Okay, let me tell you something. I've seen some of the videos that you're making, publishing over social media and YouTube, and you never have the nerve to put disclaimers in there. I say nerve. Now, let me tell you something. Let's say you're teaching knife, attack, defense, whatever, but definitely you're teaching somebody how to kill somebody. All right? What will happen, let's say, if one of your students killed someone, how far can you go to support him? I'm raising this question, why? I'm telling you honestly, I'm no longer a visitor in the court of law. Every year I have to visit the court because I have to analyze fights. And sometimes th there are times when I go to the court to defend somebody, and I have to define, define what is knife defense. You are quick to create videos of slicing somebody on throat, or, you know, stabbing, killing, and you're even sometimes proud about it. And this is how you kill. Be very careful. Be very careful, guys. I've seen how the court drama looks like when parents are begging for law enforcers to release their children because they're too young or they're not in their right minds when they killed somebody. And you still have to see the families of those who lost uh, a loved one because of this. And you are openly teaching how to kill somebody. 
All right. I'm telling you this now because you have to be careful. We know that you want to be famous. We know that you want to be, you know, teacher of a great art. Disclaimer. All right. I have seen how a prison looks like. I'm not proud of it. I've been in the court of law being asked by people, why this, why that? But you, I'm not even sure if you even have been into a real knife fight, but you are quick to make videos without disclaimers. All right, you are instructors. And when the judge asks you, sir, is this your student? He, he killed two men. Yes, he is, uh, your honor. Are you a certified instructor? Yes, I am, your honor. By whom? By an old man. A certificate, a paper signed by an old man. He's a grandmaster. Will the grandmaster be willing to support you in court? And will you be willing to support your student? Will you go to the prison with him? Most likely not. Liability. So be, be very, very careful. And sometimes, you know, when I see all these knife techniques, uh, I, I do not want to brag, okay? I, I'm really out of Filipino martial arts industry and Manom Celestino Makachur knows it because I lost interest. You know, I lost interest totally. It was Dean who asked me to come out again after 10 years. Well, thank you very much, Dean. And uh, Manong Tini hey. pushed me to, yeah. to go back as I well. <laughs> but I'm telling you, I'm telling you now, uh, <laughs> You are teaching techniques that can end lives, all right? And uh, most of the techniques that are overkill, the ones that you are showing, what is it? One attack and I, you're going to do some five, six stabs. Uh, you are definitely selling how to kill somebody. And sometimes I laugh at you. I have knife cuts in my body. I don't have to strip down. Because even if I'm trained in this, I still got cut. All right. Have you ever been in a fight? Have you ever been in a fist fight? Have you ever been in a real fight? Have you seen the court? Have you been in prison? If not, well, okay, you want to make money to teach Filipino martial arts. Be responsible. All right. That's all. Any, thank you. Thank you. Uh, anyone else like to chime in? Um, Dean. Sure. This is my issue with most of the stuff you see in YouTube regarding knife blade arts. Uh, it's horrific because you're, a lot of guys are uh, advocating knife as a defense as, uh, against another knife attack. These guys really did have no idea. They delve into the science pain. You know, I. I've been cut a lot of times, so many times. But I only realized later on the until I see the blood clot running down my arm. Sometimes delayed reaction. Delayed. <sighs> you know, um, knife. According to Masada Yub, the Lisal Institute, the ESA is a guru, gun guru, law enforcement officer. Uh, Ninety-eight percent of knife-to-knife -knife fights end up with both protagonists dead. So why are you teaching suicide? That's mutually assured suicide. So um, and I don't I, I, I don't preach knife-to-knife -knife, uh, fights. It's stupid. It's silly. It's uh, gory. And uh, the, the, for me personally. Because I've done it in high school. The best yeah, defense no. is a knife, it's a sucker punch. Sucker punch. Yeah. Somebody was flicking his uh, barbecue screw in front of my face while I was at the kiosk uh, trying to get my stuff. Was threatening the sure. I just punched him, knock him out. <laughs> Later on, I claimed, yeah. I claimed the turf. It's, it's not simple. No party, no nothing. I just punch him straight in the jaw. Well, around that time, I was punching the Makiwara 1,000 times a day. They go to school 500 times in the morning, 500 times in the afternoon. That's it. <laughs> Pain receptors are very quick. You know, hit with a mm. blood object, especially a punch. 
But the knife attack, you stab him, no, he's still gonna get you with the gun, he's no stab. So, next to knife fight in FMA is pure BS. That's all I can say. Most of yeah. the instructors we know actually have not even tasted a real punch or a kick in the face. No. You see, what more teaching somebody how to cut somebody? <laughs> yeah. I don't know where to go. Yeah, I want to share something. Professor, go ahead, sure. Add on to both Tini and to Mumbaki. Just a quick story. Sure. One of my teachers uh, told me once. He had been teaching some of the students of his. He was in another country at the time. How to use yung, the, the more fatal just in case techniques in his uh, of, of his knowledge. Okay. He cut short his stay in that country. He was on a contract working there. He was an OSW. He decided to ask permission to come to employee to go home or to leave, move to somewhere else. Why? Because one of the people he thought killed somebody else in a supermarket, wow. public place. Okay? Which means then, in that country, as far as I understood the system was, if you learn it from somebody, then the person has, the one you learned who taught it to you has also bears a share of the responsibility or the liability of having taught it to you. And then, that's what Mubak is trying to say also. Yeah. So, uh, this, this stuff, he said, it, it's regrettable that I shared it out even just once because that one time I shared it to somebody, I trusted him and he repaid it by getting into trouble. So the, the other guy was able to hide from the authorities. But because of their association together, he decided to leave anyway because it wasn't going to be helpful for him. And a good thing he did. Um, that sort of thing. So talking about liability here, uh, I, I, I don't also favor that much uh, showing all this knife to knife or whatever techniques. No, but, uh, we're recognizing that many people need to make money and so they have to make themselves famous in order to make money still. This sort of thing is also dangerous knowledge. It should be it shouldn't be treated lightly. It should be you should exercise a great deal of discretion and responsibility. That story from my teacher sobered me up really big. Okay. So ever since then, as far as these things are concerned, I approach it with very, very much caution. It would be something to think about. Thanks. Oh, I'll put in my last two cents and also got a question. Someone was asking me, actually asked me directly, what's the difference nowadays uh, with for the young generation versus the old generation? And, you know, the old men, they, they were at the lowest economic scale of society. They fought because they grew up in an environment of violence. It was yeah. open. If I should say this, I'll say this. I've almost been in several fights in the Philippines, even to like my chest is against their chest. And I'm, wa I'm environmental awareness, checking their friends, watching to see if that hand goes to our blade, watching them come to me to see if a blade's going to come out. And I'm only five, six, but I'm 170 pounds plus right now. And in the totally Philippines, over. I'm a big guy. Yeah, you are. <laughs> I'm a big guy for the Philippines. It sounds ridiculous. Never have I ever seen a Filipino even this short back down. <laughs> they will fight you till you either have to put them away yeah. or something. So you don't want to get in fights. And I back down because it's like I have no business. I have no. I used to volunteer in the Makati City Prison, actually doing a garden, a permaculture project. But. Um, and I, I couldn't believe this. They actually let the inmates use like bolos and shovels and pickaxes in there. I'm like, when I went there and I saw them come out with the farming tools, I was like, oh my Lord, I'm in Makati City Jail. And they're letting them have those. I was scared. <laughs> anyway, side, side point. Um, if they are really teaching you to, f I'll take out this. If they're really teaching it was, the curriculum was more big. But I also saw, 
some of the older guys already trying to change their curriculums for Westerners. And I'm a, I was a visitor to the Philippines, so they had a lot of extender curriculum. We do have system. Bill McGrath's a good example. Uh, Ina Santos, another example. Modern Arnis, another example. They were developing modern martial arts systems that were an accumulation of a ton of techniques from many sources. But that's not traditional FMA. FMA, traditional FMA was like, what's your environment? Protect yourself with, here's what you train, this is what you drill in. And so that's the difference between before and now. And like, you know, I get asked all the time when I spar, hey, this is a nice sparring. I really don't like it, especially these younger guys, 20 years younger than me. They're fast. But the truth of the matter is like, okay, I'll play the game. And if it's fun, that's great. But if it really self defense, which is really understand self defense for students. I was teaching them in my first thing to make self defense, but I'm like, Look, you're going to one of the best universities in the country. You have a professional career. You should be using 80% of what I'm teaching. You're learning a traditional teaching method. So you need to be able to differentiate and teach appropriately. Because FMA is often a terrible self defense system from a. Elric. Elric, we can't hear you, Elric. Can you hear me now? Yeah, I'm here. Well, it's uh, it's Did you hear me? Hear me? No. I didn't hear you. Feedback. It's a little, a little, but nothing. How about now? Is that better? Yeah. Oh. Now I hear feedback too. All right. But anyway, I'm off my high horse. I'm off my soapbox. Huh. But yeah, train your self-defense. You have to separate self-defense for what's appropriate for your students. No, I agree. Um, we're uh, wow. Out of time. <laughs> we're not two hours. No, we went over. No worries. We went over. Just for the folks who are listening, um, if you did have questions we didn't get to, which I'm sure there is, um, just because of the volume here that we were trying to cover and getting all these our wonderful guests or opportunity to talk and shine. Um, if you have something that you really want answered and we didn't get to it, I apologize. My suggestion would be to email or PM one of these, uh, one of these you know, guys. They, I'm sure they'd be more than happy to answer for you what we didn't get to. Um, I've done in the past and they've all been very cordial and friendly and very willing to answer questions. So again, um, just as a time issue here, uh, this interview just passed two hours. Which, um, wow. Uh, but, yeah, yeah, huh? but it was great stuff. I mean, it just, uh, it kind of flew, you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, <clears throat> also, some of you guys are putting comments. I'm just gonna, I'm, I just have to say this. And if those are offended by what I'm saying, so be it. This is a group and this is an interview. It doesn't mean this gives you a platform to like just bad mouth somebody when they're watching or bring up a name that you're not really sure about an incident and all that. Um, much better to handle those things in private messaging and all that because I will remove them and really don't care what you think and all that, okay? This is a clean group. I don't allow for that stuff and you're not gonna do it to me on the interview. And if you don't like it, don't watch any more interviews. Don't come to the group. It's pretty simple. But I will make the rules when there is basically being disrespect being exhibited right there and all that. And that's that. Okay. Sorry that negativity had to be brought up, but some people just don't get it. Okay. Now I'm looking forward to reading the comments. <laughs> don't delete yeah, them for a day, Dean. One, <laughs> Yeah, 189 comments is, uh, wow. <laughs> yeah, you guys, I just want to say, um, going back to the positive now, you guys are absolutely wonderful. I, I want to thank you so much for coming on. And, um, you know, I, this was absolutely fantastic. This is going to be, uh, it's going to be a big hit. <laughs> uh, Can I say I, one last thing? Oh, please, please. Yeah. So it's like, you know, all of us, five of us on here, we all love 
you know, Filipino culture. We love, uh, you know, our heritage, whether it's by blood or by, you know, you were born for this to interview all these folks, Dean. Um, that's universal. And yeah. yeah, there is modern FMA that is an amalgamation of many sources. But the issue is when you claim it's something that it's not. So yeah, if it works for you, it works for your students, keep doing it. That's great. Sure. You know, yeah. but also, you know, take the time. We, you know, the the four of us on, on the call, I mean, we spent time talking to a lot of people, uh, teaching different folks, learning from them, sparring with different folks, or teaching people who spar, you know. That's that's where the, the true joy of FMA comes from. It's not just talking I, about it, it's actually doing it. I totally agree. Like one of the best things I would explain to somebody that's come out of these interviews, I've met like like matter of fact, all you guys, like right on here, I've met through these interviews. Like I would have never ever gotten the chance to talk to any of you guys and all that if it wasn't like for these interviews. So like these interviews have opened up, not just like information and getting better you know you know not just information but better you know and horizons and all that but more importantly the people that i've come in contact with and met and all that just fascinating people and you obviously and you four are obviously you know in that in that grouping um you know so i just want to thank you guys for agreeing to do this taking time to collectively do this i know we went over but it was well worth it guru mabaki did a lot of i know homework on this so i truly appreciate it and uh guru elric thank you for you know, allowing us to use um you know, your account there and set this up because be live unfortunately folks those who might not know only allows a total of um four guests so be live wasn't an option so guru elric um was kind enough to let us uh, use his um, Zoom account here and all that. So I thank you. I appreciate that and all that. Uh, Professor Giacano, any closing statements? Oh. <laughs> all right. <laughs> thank you, Dean, for inviting us again. And oh thanks my gosh, to my pleasure. My three comrades, too, for uh, joining up and we have the discussion and exchange with one another. Hopefully one day we can see one another in person after the pandemic is over and maybe we can do some real uh, crossing hands and all that sort of thing. Um, and I was looking through the comments here uh, in the in the uh, post here and you know just uh, something here uh, to point out one. Um, personally, I'm still very much on that journey, that same as Dean is. So I'm still learning a lot more from my own arts, from the from the past, from me learning, uh, rediscovering the past, and learning some new things too from my uh, current teachers. And uh, the, the the thing is here. It's it's been said many times, like the Christmas song says, uh, many times, many ways, right? But instead of wishing you guys Merry Christmas, which you've already done, <laughs> okay, I'll put it this way: always keep an open mind and keep yourself uh, willing to learn. That way, we get much much further along the path. Okay, um, I've, I've seen some fascinating questions here, and. Um, like for one of them who's asked, have we been down south to study some of these arts? And I'd say one day, it's one of my goals one day to do and to experience uh, that, uh, the experience the arts as they are in the original setting. Okay, And that's why I said that because I still am, even if, uh, you know, Having come this far, I'm already at this particular age. I'm still fascinated. I'm still willing to learn, and I'm still um, being so taken up with the beauty of our local arts. Even the negativity of the net, um, it, it comes with the territory. Okay, but there's for me, I would rather focus on the beauty and the cultural value, the, the cultural heritage, and of course the practical use of everything that we have. It's a pretty long statement, basically. Um, again, 
just love hunting. Always be a student. You learn more that way. That's it. Yeah, man, I love that. Always be a student. I, I man, I couldn't agree with more. I couldn't agree with that more. Absolutely. Uh, so, uh, Montino, anything? Uh, anything from you? Time ago, until my back is on the season, and Jay Ignacio visited and pestered me one day, <laughs> 2011. It wasn't until 2018 that I formally launched my own uh, variant of the campo. I call now is to call the campo. I just got burned out, you know. Mm-hmm. Not because um, I was intimidated by all the the hate uh, negativity arising from the book. I co-wrote with Ned, Dr. Ned Pangi, the late Ned Pangi. So here's one thing um, I would like uh, parting words. Uh, I look at the teaching of uh, FMA martial arts as an ethical product, more like prescription drugs. You're a flunk, <laughs> advertise it. If you've noticed, Dean, I don't, I'm not everywhere. I only stick in my own group, so called the couple, and sometimes in your FMA discussion group. I'm not, I'm not like the others because it takes real a great deal of responsibility to teach something that you know can cost lives, you know, hurt people. So doctors are not allowed to <laughs> advertise, right? So I look at it as an ethical product. So a lot of people are hurt by what we have the the, the content we we've been saying all this uh, during this uh, interview during this show with you. I'm sorry, but um, you have to lay it down, you know, as it is. Yeah. Correct, and, uh, correct narrative, the truthful narrative of uh, Filipino martial arts. That's all, Dean. Uh, Merry Christmas, everyone. No, it was fantastic. Thank you. Guru uh, Mabaki, any uh, closing from you? <laughs> well, I'm, I'm simply grateful be with uh, these three famous gentlemen. Absolutely. <laughs> It's the first time we ever got together for, for this. And, uh, you know, I visit Manong Tini in Cebu every year, at least once a year. And uh, also, when I have time, I visit uh, Professor Hokano. And uh, I never lost contact with this guy. And Elric, well, Elric has been very, very busy, but I'm really thankful that we are still connected. <laughs> and then for those who are asking me if I ever teach uh, Filipino martial arts in the Philippines, uh, well, I have a group. It's in the Pasay Road. It's called uh, Elorde Boxing Gym, the, where the, my team, the dungeon, practices. Uh, I, I only teach in that group because these people are responsible. Else, I'm a student of Manong Tini <laughs> in Largo Mano. <laughs> And I'm really, really glad, uh, Manong, thank you. And like I said, uh, I've been in, in the Filipino martial arts since I was in high school. And I stopped in the year 2010. Well, because of some organization who wanted to destroy my name. But I did not actually stop teaching. I was, uh, right now I'm teaching inside the military academy in Russia. In Russia. And uh, for me, that, that, that's it. That's it. I'm, I'm happy with that. I don't need to advertise myself. But when we need to share, when we need to share something, just let, let me know. And Dean, uh, please come over to the Philippines. All right, the Philippine borders are open now for guests. Fly yeah, I know. I have to. Uh, I'm going to have to mm-hmm. endure that long flight. The, the big thing will be the mask, like if that <laughs> wearing the mask that whole flight. That's. Um, I'm hoping that's going to like go away soon. Maybe like they'll take that away. I'm I'm hoping. Uh, but yeah, but no, I definitely have to get over there. That's that's definitely on the bucket list. Just obviously. Want to meet all you guys and obviously yeah. train over there. I'll send you a that. vaccine. Mm-hmm. I'll send you a vaccine from Russia if you want. You can inject that. So will you it be uh, like one one hundred proof vodka or something? Yeah, <laughs> in a way. One hundred proof vodka, huh? And... Okay. <laughs> you inject that. Yeah. This will it take has... care. Of... 
this will be better than any vaccine known to mankind. Just inject yeah. this. Yes. It has 10% uh, Viagra too, so it's going to be good. <laughs> You're a naughty, naughty man. Uh, oh, 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 like, I forgot we're live. Okay, I thought we it's just us talking. Anyway, Merry Christmas, guys. Thank you very much. No, and, thank you all. And, thank hey, you. if I happen not to talk to any of you, please, please, I hope you guys all have a fantastic Happy New Year. We will have. Thank you very much. Guys, thank, thank you. you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dean. Thank you. Hey, Eric, thanks for hosting us. Well, Thank you, yeah. Elric. Thank you. Thank you. Good night, everyone. Thank you. Yeah. Bye. Take care. Now I'm going to click Take stop care. for live now. All right. Yay. Hey, guys.